All right, so it's 6.02, so I think, I think there's enough people in here that we can start. So, hi everyone, how's it going? Um, so welcome to the Gator Motorsports General Body Meeting. We can move on to the next slide. I don't know what is going on. I'm trying. Do already. Oof. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Hey. All right. So my name is Randy Ruiz. I am the president this year for the team, as well as I also work on the aerodynamics team. My name is Mitchell Taney. Uh, I'm the recruitment coordinator, one of them for this year, and I do work on ergonomics. <laughs> my name is Michael Seaman. I am the other recruitment coordinator, and I'm the fueling. Yeah, so just a quick review of what we're going to cover in this GBM. So we're going to talk about who we are as a team and what we do. And we're going to jump into what the competition is about. Uh, talk about our plans for this season, especially with COVID. Uh, and then, you know, bring up some stuff about why joining this team might be valuable for you. So moving right in uh, to talk about who we are. So in short, we are a team of UF students who come together to design a technically advanced car. Um, and learn good engineering practices along the way. Um, the cooler way of saying this is that we're a bunch of students that get to build a race car and be better engineers as we do it. So it's a really cool opportunity that you get here at UF. Um, this year is a very special year for us. Um, we've been building cars, the team's been building cars since 1991. So this would mark our 30 year anniversary. And for that year, we have some special, some really cool innovations that we're trying to bring into the car this year. Uh, so it's definitely a really cool time to be around. Um, you know, we have a lot of history and a lot of alumni, so it's definitely, definitely cool. And over the years, we've been um, pretty competitive in the competition. We've placed very high, about many top 10 finishes, about one third of our finishes have been in the top 10, as well as in 2015, we actually placed second place overall, which is um, really shows you how competitive we can be in this international competition. Um, so uh, move to the next slide, please. So, um, so here's the F20 car. Um, due to COVID, we weren't actually able to bring it to competition. Um, however, we did build a car. There's some pictures there um, uh, before Arrow was installed, uh, but just some specs, some highlights about what the car was. So uh, the car uses a 2007 Honda CBR 600, which produces 72 horsepower at um, 11,000 RPM. Now you might be hearing 72 horsepower and think well, that's pretty weak, that's pretty, pretty low number. But um, because the car is so light, we can actually go from zero to 60 in just about three seconds, uh, have a top speed of 80 miles per hour, and we can pull up to 2.2 Gs in lateral acceleration. Um, so if you're not really into cars, those numbers are really, really fast. Um, if you've ever gone zero to 60 in about three seconds, uh, it's really an experience. Um, our aero package uh, generates about 100 pounds of downforce at 35 miles per hour. Uh, and we on the aerodynamics team always like to, to brag that if we were going at say around 70 miles per hour, our aero package will actually produce enough downforce that will equal the weight of the car and we could theoretically drive it upside down. So it's a pretty cool thing um, that we'd like to brag about on aero. Um, and recently we've introduced something called the drag reduction system, which is able to reduce the drag um, of the wing by opening up the flaps uh, and reduce it by up to 40%. So we can make our car go faster. Um, last year, yeah, we do, everyone loves DRS. <laughs> Um, last year was a big year for us, um, this F20 car, which is um, we introduced 10-inch wheels for the first time. Uh, in previous seasons, we've run 13-inch wheels. Uh, so now with these 10-inch wheels, it, re it required a full redesign of, of suspension, as well as many other components and systems of the car. And it brought about a lot of good dynamic um, advantages, as well as simply just reducing the weight by having less stuff. Uh, and with that, so the weight of our car this year was 430 pounds without the driver, which is pretty light. Um, so yeah, now I'll pass it on to Mitchell to talk about team structure. Alrighty, yeah. Uh, so this is our, our rough team structure for this year. Uh, there's 10 systems and those systems are, uh, on the technical side, they're controlled by people like the captain, uh, who is Daniel Tremblay, and uh, the co-captain, who is Chris Magnus, and the president, who is Randy, who was just talking. And then the e-board uh, is controlled by the president and um, it's just more for management side of things. Um, something that's not on this team structure is our sister team, which started last year. It's Gator Electric Racing. It's actually, uh, they are going to race in the Formula EV competition, which is, it's the same as, you know, regular Formula, Formula SAE, but um, it's, it has an electric powertrain instead of uh, typical internal con combustion. So 
yeah pretty cool um see if I can, okay there we go so our annual schedule we have a pretty cyclical schedule uh we go to competition every year so we try to like make sure it's, it's nice and smooth the uh, design and manufacturing process before we make it to competition so in summer right after competition we uh, review how we did um, and uh, start on preliminary designs start like deciding what we want to to make changes to this year what we want to keep and yeah stuff like that um, then when fall hits we start finalizing our designs that we've made and uh, we begin manufacturing and something that's not on there is we uh, often start testing around this time uh, with uh, designs being finalized we can kind of start implementing things that might be on the new car uh, that we kind of want to like tweak before we actually put it on the new car uh, so we can kind of put it on the old car and just make sure like it works well before uh, we start like fully implementing yeah. it um, and then winter break uh, we typically ask members to stay over winter break if they're dedicated uh, because it's a really great opportunity to have like a lot of time to focus on the car instead of classes. Um, so that's when we do really the manufacturing of most of the systems on the car. Uh, that's when the, the frame gets manufactured. Uh, so that's when we can start like putting the car together as a whole. And then spring, once that's finished, we do first drive, which is like all the uh, essential systems are on the car and running. And we just make sure like the car can drive. Um, and from that point on, we can start like adding things like aero, things like uh, that are not super essential to making sure the car can drive, but you know, things that benefit performance. Um, and we can start testing that like during spring break and just during spring in general. And uh, then we reach competition, which is when we take the car up to Michigan. And uh, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. So what we do on Gator Motorsports, we, like we said, we design a new car every year. Um, and we use engineering software like uh, finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics to simulate stresses and forces for both solid and fluid mechanics. Um, we validate our designs through all sorts of testing, uh, stuff like on track and, uh, you know, structures get, uh, you know, structural testing like three point bending tests and stuff like that. Um, and we manufacture the car almost entirely in house. Uh, so we put everything together in our shop and our, our various different um, off-campus facilities. And uh, yeah, we have manual and CNC mills and lathes. And we also do a lot of com composite manufacturing, stuff like carbon fiber. And then we do stuff like welding as well. Um, so the competition, like I mentioned earlier, it is a global competition. So teams from all around the world can compete in this competition. It's in Michigan, um, which is the largest Formula SAE event known worldwide. Um, and around 120 teams compete every year. Uh, we are evaluated based on stuff like cost, business, and engineering design. That's like kind of like how our team works. Um, and then we're also, of course, evaluated on how the car works uh, through both, um, through mostly dynamic events uh, and you can see all those listed down there um and yeah the the scoring is broken down in that pie chart there so you can kind of see like what's more important endurance is clearly the biggest factor uh so completing most most teams don't even complete endurance and that's actually something we were able to do in the last competition we attended in 2019 so that was a huge thing that we were able to complete endurance it's just like running the car for something like 40 kilometers and uh, yeah. So we were really proud to have been able to complete that. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Michael so he can go ahead and run through the rest. All right, so uh, I'm gonna start off by talking about this season. So obviously uh, we are gonna be changing how we do things. Um, but first of all, a huge design change that we're trying to accomplish this season is uh, switching over to a carbon fiber monocoque chassis uh, from the previous steel space frame. So uh, we're hoping to have a lot more composite manufacturing, so that should be a great time. Uh, chassis Lead is doing a great job on that, and, uh, so is that entire team. Um, in terms of the shop opening due to COVID-19, um, 
we don't have a set date on that yet, but hopefully that will be happening soon. Um, competition has not been canceled for this season, so uh, we're going full force. Uh, there are going to be some heavy restrictions in the shop. Uh, we will be requiring uh, personal masks as well as safety glasses. Um, we're going to be having limited personnel. And uh, we're going to be running by, if you can do it at home, do it at home. So a lot, of the, a lot of the work that we do, a lot of the testing and a lot of the design can all be done using a software like SolidWorks. So we're fortunate enough to be able to do a lot of work by ourselves and at home. That being said, we do have online meetings and online shop hours where anybody can join at any time. And uh, there are members in there pretty much all the time working on whatever they're working on. So that's definitely a great opportunity if you just want to join and see what people are doing and, and learn from us. So, yeah, next slide. So one of, one of the big questions that probably asking yourself is why, why join Gator Motorsports? So here at GMS, you have the opportunity to learn skills that just aren't taught in the classroom. So we operate under a real schedule-based design and manufacturing uh, schedule. So this simulates industry experience about as thoroughly as you can do it as a student in college. Um, we have members come back from internships and even members who go on to future careers come back and say that what we do in the shop is very similar to what they do in their careers. So it really is a great opportunity. Um, you will be challenging yourself. Obviously, building a race car isn't easy. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication, but being able to watch the car that you built drive and compete is very, very rewarding. Um, you really have a sense of community on this team. Uh, you, you build a network of teammates that you'll have the chance to learn from and grow with over, over the years, and uh, you will most likely be developing relationships with these people. I know I've made a ton of friends through this team and it's a great opportunity to meet new people. And then last but not least, internship opportunities. Uh, companies love students from, S from FSAE due to the unparalleled experience offered because of how closely we simulate industry. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I just wanted to, to comment really quick. Uh, yeah. A lot of, uh, applications to, to big companies like Ford and SpaceX ask specifically, like, do you do for, like competitions like Formula SAE? So that's just, that goes to show you how, uh, how much they really care about this type of thing. Yeah, actually, I am going to add one last little thing on there. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, it's, it's definitely nice being able to talk about your student design team with recruiters when they ask you what you do and what kind of separates you from the rest. And that, that really does come from that industry or the simulated industry experience that we have. And it's a, it's, it's a great opportunity. So when you, when you first join GMS, um, the, the first thing that you can expect is we like to get you started off on SOLIDWORKS. So one of the main reasons why we start you off with this rather than anything else is if you do any design work on this team, you will be using SOLIDWORKS. So it really gives you a good baseline understanding of the fundamental thing that we use to design our car. So after you have the basics of SOLIDWORKS down, um, that's usually when we like to assign new member projects. Well, not necessarily assign, but you'll have the opportunity to do new member projects. So these can range from manufacturing help to just small design projects. Um, one of the cooler design projects that I've heard is uh, our, our current suspension lead. Uh, when he was a new member, he actually designed the inboard ends for the suspension. So these aren't really just small, busy work projects. You have an impact, and that's, that's a great thing. Um, so another thing that you will be doing uh, as a new member is a lot of research. Uh, there's a lot to be learned on this team. I'm, I'm still learning every single day. I still have a lot more to learn, but the more that you research, the better you become, the better engineer you are, and it's, it's a great thing to learn. So another, another thing that new members have the opportunity to do is uh, go to testing and experience what it's like to run the car and uh, 
see how we how we go about that process. So uh, that's that's a lot of fun those days. Um, and then one of the one of the big things that new members tend to do is a lot of manufacturing. So I I personally love this aspect uh, of the team working with mills, working with lathes, just working with metal in general, composites, and honestly whatever you could think of we work on. So it, it gives you the chance to develop those skills that you wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to develop. And then last but not least, uh, the thing that you can expect if you put some time into motorsports is that's when you get integrated into systems. So this is where you typically have the higher up design projects. That's where you really, or, uh, that's where you really gain a core or a spot as a core member of the team. And uh, so it's a great thing. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, so um, how you can join GMS is you can reach out to any of us. Uh, all majors are welcome. Uh, there's our contact info right there. Um, something that I'm going to say that isn't written here is we don't care if you don't have any experience with cars. We don't care if you have no experience with engineering you can learn everything that you need to learn on this team. Um, I, I didn't know anything coming in, but because of the people that brought me up and taught me how to be an engineer, I, I can say that I'm a way better engineer right now than I was a year ago. And I, I have this club to thank for that. So uh, I, I encourage you all to reach out to us. Um, and uh, I could second that. Me and uh, Michael joined, I think, around the same time, and we're yeah. in the same position, so. Um, I think that it's a really great it's a really great experience. You learn a lot, so he's not lying. Try not to. <laughs> yeah, but um, you can join at any time. Uh, the season is starting right now, so if you really want to get in and do a lot of work, now is the best time. But again, you can join whenever. If for whatever reason you just can't join this semester. Uh, you can join the spring, still have an impact, it's still possible, but uh, we'd, we'd love to have you, whether it's now or then. Yeah, um, so it would be great if uh, everybody could, if you're interested in joining, if you could reach out to the email, that's the main uh, source of contact that we use. So that, that first bullet point. Right. So uh, we're going to start on the Q&A portion. So uh, we already have a question in here is, uh, will there be interviews for leadership positions or will people be moved up with more experience? That's a good question. Um, I guess I can take this one. Uh, yeah, thank you for putting that in the chat, Randy. Um, so typically uh, on the team, you really put in work to be able to uh, gain a, a higher spot on the team. So um, everybody that's on like eboard and stuff typically has to have a, a, a substantial amount of work that they've already put into the team and shown promise. Uh, you have to get nominated by the rest of the team to at least get an eboard position. Uh, so that means like everybody else has to recognize that you've uh, really been dedicated. Uh, and in the same vein, uh, the captain is who chooses the system leads. So they have to really see you working hard to be able to um, assign you that role. Yeah, and usually uh, with those roles, they they seem to kind of develop over time. Usually uh, before the end of the previous season, it's pretty much a given who's going to be leading that system in the next season. Um, and that's that's not really something that I say to try to intimidate you. It's just that it's it's something that you work for, but um, it's it's definitely possible. I'm I'm a second year, and uh, I'm. I'm a system lead and actually so is Carl. So we, um, we, or we do like to give the opportunity. So it's it really just depends. Yeah, and I'll just quickly touch on um, eboard position. So yes, you have to get nominated by a few people on the team in order to be considered um, for a position on eboard. And then you run through just your typical like election, your democratic election where you'll answer some questions, every candidate will answer some questions. And then at the end, the team will vote on who they think is the best candidate for that position. And I'll quickly just take the next question here about, is there an application? No, just uh, reach out to us and we can get you started. 
Let's see. I'll, I'll read this next question. I think the recruiters can answer this one the best. Um, so they said, Andrew said, hi, I reached out beforehand. What comes after the research assignments? And once I get those done, does that mean I've joined? So. Yeah, I can take this one. I've been dealing with this. Um, so once you're done with the research assignments, uh, I will give you an invite to our Slack workspace and uh, you can join and message me and I'll get you started on some more work. Um, the, the joined part, it's kind of funny. There's, it's, it's kind of ambiguous uh, knowing when you've joined the team. It's not like a, a black and white thing. Um, so new members are typically members of the team, but uh, they don't have specific roles quite yet, usually. Um, and we, we have an event in the spring where we kind of induct new members, but uh, even still, like, I personally didn't get inducted because um, so, I joined in the spring. So, um, yeah, it's not like a, a black and white thing. Um, but typically, just once you've started getting projects and stuff, that's when uh, we kind of look at you as, as, as a member, I guess. Yeah, I can expand a little bit on this. Um, so if you're talking about whether you're considered a part of the team or not, I mean, as soon as you reach out to us and you start working, you're, you're a part of the team, you join the team and you're, you're a member that, you know, contribute to work. Um, like uh, Mitchell was saying about like this induction thing that we do in the spring, it's just kind of like, it's not really an induction of like, now you're part of the team and before you weren't part of the team. It's just more like a time to recognize the work that new members have done um, over the past few months. Um, but in terms of just like joining the team, yeah, as, I mean, if you're, you join as soon as you- Oh my God, brother. Uh, All right. Um, but yeah, wrapping it up. Yeah. I mean, once, once you start working on the team, you're a part of the team. And then in the spring, we can recognize the, the things that you've done for us. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, let's see. So we got a question from Jet. Um, have you had student athletes in the club that manage both their support, both their report and the club. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if anybody knows about um, a person who's been uh, in a sport and this club at the same time. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also not sure of anybody who has, but I, I will say that this is a pretty hefty time commitment. Yeah. Right. Did I cut yeah. someone off? Was someone trying to say something? I don't know. Um, I, was gonna say, I don't think anyone has, but I think it's, it's probably, it's definitely possible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you definitely if you if you manage your time properly, I think you can you can definitely do both. Mm -hmm. um, it just is a lot of time commitment if you really want to put in a lot of hours into the club and, and get a lot done. So for sure. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's up to you. Um, I did want to ask a question about the time commitment. Um, I know that you, most of you guys are engineering students and things like that. So how do you manage between your classes and this high commitment club? Kind of like how did you kind of like um, balance those things? I can I can take this one. So um, one of the one of the big things that you learn when you join this team is uh, how to manage your time properly. Um, we're all fairly successful, or most of us are successful students. It's definitely possible to succeed in your coursework and this club. Mm -hmm. um, it's I wouldn't say that joining this club is just as easy as if you weren't to join but it definitely helps having upperclassmen in this club that have gone through the exact same courses that you've gone through can give advice and who can true, show you true. how to succeed so um that's that's kind of something that i've been working on this semester is uh managing my time properly and i've already learned a lot about how to manage my own personal time and uh mm. If you, if you join this club, you, you will too. Definitely. And I also wanted to ask about what kind of research assignments do you give to new members? They're, they're not very in-depth. Um, they, don't, they don't take a whole lot of time, but it's basically just to give you like a baseline knowledge of whatever you're interested in. So mm -hmm. uh, you can talk to leads or talk to whoever and kind of expand on that, if that makes sense. Okay, so from the start, you're not like bound to a single, like if I say I want to work on like the drive chain team and the next thing you know, I wanted to work on the aerodynamics team later on. Not I'm all. not specifically bound by like that one thing because I started out there. I can actually kind of like be in multiple kind of things as long as like I'm properly um, having a positive impact in those areas. 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah. Um, yeah. to give you an idea, um, since I'm a second year, uh, mm -hmm. my entire fall and even the summer, I was a member of suspension and I did a lot of work for suspension, but um, my interest shift or shifted mm -hmm. over to bowling and that's kind of what I wanted to do. So I, I developed my skills in that uh, aspect or that field and uh, I, I, I'm a lead now. Um, so you can, you can definitely shift your interests. You can change what you want to work on. Um, no, but no matter what, you will have an impact on this team if that answers your question. Cool. Yeah. I would like to add, though, um, obviously, yeah, we don't bound you to any system and we don't like force you to do something you don't want to do. Um, but obviously, if you find something that you like early on and commit to it, and you can pour a lot of hours into that one system, you can obviously have a greater impact on that system and learn a lot more about that specific thing as opposed to like doing one thing one semester and one thing the other semester. You just can't get as invested into a particular system or a particular project if you just keep um, jumping around. So I think that's yeah. Like, but yeah, we definitely encourage new members to explore their options early on and try to find what, what fits for them, you know. I've done a few things for like oiling and suspension and things like that when I was a new member just to try it out. But ultimately, you know, I wanted to do aero and I got into it and I really liked it and I just continued doing that for hmm. my time here. Yeah, definitely. And one of the things that I did fear was I do want to be in this club and kind of really learn how to like make a car and all those other nice things. But I know that if I'm not properly taught um, by somebody who's like well endowed in like the club, then I'm probably going to like drift away and only come to those main meetings. So is there like a, not formal per se, but kind of like, is there like a dedicated team to help us really learn what's going on? Because I know that sometimes when you guys are really in the deep of the thread, like working on like an upcoming competition, you guys get really busy. So like new members who are trying to learn about this doesn't get the time for specific people. So is there like a dedicated team to really teach us like what's going on, like how to kind of be on page and like in pace with you guys? Yeah, yeah, that's that's our job. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, recruitment. Sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, wait, Mitchell, did you did you want to add something else? I mean, I was just gonna say, like, we're always on Slack. We're always like ready to talk to people, like over email too. I'm always on there. Um, yeah. So, like, just reach out to us if you need anything at all, and we're happy to help. Yeah. Something else that uh we're trying to get started this season is uh Tuesdays and Thursdays. If uh, you want to come to the virtual shop hours. Oh yeah. Uh, if you want to come to the virtual shop hours, uh, we're in, we want to dedicate a portion of our time to you guys to ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, if any projects come to our mind that any new member can help with, we will tell you about mm -hmm. those. But um, something that our captain just put in the chat was uh, new member lectures. So basically- Yeah, what, something like that. Yeah, so basically what that is, is uh, every system or every system leader, or system engineer, basically just gives a short hour long lecture or so about the basics of their system. Mm -hmm. So uh, this will hopefully give you a good idea of what exactly you want to do on the car. Um, I wouldn't say that these necessarily like create a concrete path to being a system engineer, but this will give you a very good idea of what you can do to get there. Nice. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah of course. And I, I will have one final statement to that. Obviously it's like the recruitment, like uh, the recruitment team's job to kind of inter interact with new members and sort of get them started on the team. But I mean, everybody on the team is dedicated to helping the recruitment efforts and everybody on the team is super friendly and super open and they want to teach new people. Um, it's something as older members on the team, we love to do, right? Knowledge transfer is one of the biggest um, things on the team that we have to, to keep uh, doing in order to maintain, you know, an educated team. So definitely, you know, if you have questions about anything, a particular system or something like that, you know, always feel free to reach out to anybody on the team and, and ask them a question. You know, they'll be more than happy to reply to you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, uh, if you guys have any more questions, you can, you can either unmute yourself and, and ask them or you can just drop them in the chat and we'll just keep, we'll keep answering your questions as long as you have them. If those are breaking questions, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Tremblay. I'm a team captain. I'm a fourth year mechanical engineering student here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how I got here. 
and some things maybe you'll, you'll, you'll find interesting. Um, so yeah, I'm the team captain. Uh, I've been a part of this team for four years now. Uh, I've been a part of this team a lot. Um, I think that's something that you may have heard of from other people uh, if you're looking to join this team is that we are pretty dedicated. Um, maybe uh, that is intimidating. I can assure you it's not. Uh, this team is driven. Um, and what I mean by that is that the people who, who are in leadership roles or, and are really the core team spend a lot of time doing these things. Uh, it's not because we force them to, it's because they're internally motivated to learn and do a better job at, at, uh, individually. So if you look at some other statistics, uh, like the average team uh, GPA is actually higher than the department average GPA. Uh, and that is in addition to all the hours they're spending working on GMS related things. So uh, I highly encourage you to to join, not only is this team extremely rewarding, but you are surrounded by 30 or 40 other individuals who are also extremely motivated. Um, that does not necessarily mean only in terms of, of getting things done on a team. Uh, the nice part is that if you join the team, you'll have people who are kind of in the general same area in terms of schooling as you, people taking the same classes, it'll be easier to collaborate, um, receive help from older members who've taken those classes before, in terms of the team, uh, the, the phrase that we always say is you get out what you put in. Uh, that means basically the amount of time you're able to commit to the project uh, will be rewarded with leadership positions and obviously experience. Um, but I think that being said, there is an amount of opportunity for anyone with any amount of time commitment, uh, like Mitchell, Randy, and Michael have been saying, uh, there are projects, there are structured projects uh, that introduce you to the team, but ultimately it is uh, up to you in terms of where you go from there, uh, whether that be member progression or learning specific skills. Uh, we have some members on the team that have been, been I think Mac has been a member on the team for, for less than two months now, and he's already designing a critical su suspension component, uh, learning finite element analysis, suspension kinematics, and a bunch of, of crazy things that a, a junior otherwise would be introduced to in school and is uh, learning fundamental calculations and classwork that is two years ahead of what he'd be doing or, or a year ahead of what he'd be doing. And that's simply because uh, he's kind of found that project and he's, he's, he's ran away with it. Uh, Josh, who's working uh, on the chassis team, is designing a carbon fiber monocoque for the first time uh, in our team's history and is probably the leading undergraduate um, in terms of understanding how composites work, structural composites knowledge. And that's simply because uh, the team gave him the ability to pursue that project. Uh, think of this team not so much as a, a structured thing where you're given tasks, but as the, the vessel for which you can learn new skills that you want to on your own. Obviously, when you think of being an engineer, everyone says, oh, I want to do FEA. I want to, I want to learn ANSYS. I want to learn Abacus, whatever it is. And, and this team really gives you the opportunity and the resources to learn those things. Uh, certainly, it's, it's uh, super rewarding. And I think that everyone here is uh, really for helping people and getting them. It's, it's, uh, it's something nice. I'm pretty competitive. So it's nice to be able to walk into a room and be surrounded by people who are driven and are knowledgeable. And maybe that's intimidating at first, but I can guarantee you that over time, as you uh, spend time on the project, that will be rewarding. And certainly, uh, we hope to, to have you be one of those knowledgeable members in the future. So uh, hopefully that, that clears some things up and that was useful. Thanks. Um, a quick, sorry, but I did want to ask a quick question about what days would you guys be meeting for? Um, I understand like the COVID kind of really impacted like your um, regular days um, schedule, but like, before COVID and things like that, what were you guys' intended schedules as far as like meeting in the workshops and like having discussions and things like that? So I can kind of see where I could put that into my schedule. Pretty much weekdays after six. Um, weekends, shops or shop was open basically all the time. Um, a lot of us like to just go into the shop uh, weekdays after six. Uh, we we like to kind of simulate that with the virtual shop hours um, and then that being said uh, we do also have several systems or uh, a group of systems that have meetings that you can attend uh, but, but yeah cool cool uh, that makes sense yeah that makes sense all right yeah good also that uh, every sunday we have sort of um regular team meetings I don't know if Michael said that or not, he cut out of it. But yeah, every Sunday at 4 p.m. we have team meetings to kind of go over what we did last week and sort of the plans going forward for next week. 
Uh, and then Matt has a question in the chat saying, what is a good starting workload weekly um, for new members? Um, so I can start this one and then, you know, Mitchell and Michael, you guys can jump in. Um, I'll, I'll just talk about like what I did and my experience and hopefully that can guide you into maybe what it's like. Um, so I started three years ago, uh, summer of 2018, I believe. Um, and so basically since it was a summer and I was just getting to into school, spent a lot of time, started the first half in my classes, kind of just getting to know the school and things like that. Uh, and then when I joined GMS, um, you know, I had, I was taking some fairly easy classes um, during the summer. So I would just pretty much whatever free time I had um, during the summer, I would just kind of walk into the shop and just talk to people and, and try to do a project here and there and just try to progress through through the, the new member stuff to, to get into the, the cooler things, in my opinion. Um, so, so that was me. I just, um, you know, tried to pour in as much time as I could because I know that if I would put a lot of time in now, that I could get, you know, far ahead in, in the future. Um, but obviously as classes started to pick up, you know, I had to balance my time more carefully. So I wasn't overspending time in the shop and not focusing on things like classes and just generally like my mental health and things like that. Um, but I would say, you know, uh, in terms of managing your time, I would say put in the time you think you can. Don't force yourself to put in too much time if it's hurting your grades or if it's hurting you know, just your emotional and mental state. Um, I sort of, at least now, like being three years into the team, I kind of just set a schedule for myself. So, you know, I say like, oh, from six to nine, from six to eight every day, I'll spend time working on this, on the team. And then, you know, if I have spare time, I'll work on it after. Yeah, like Joshua says, scheduling is key. If you can find a good schedule, you can find a way to fit this into your schedule. Like, like from five to eight, I'll, I'll spend time in the shop and do stuff. I think that's definitely the best way to do it. Um, in terms of like to directly answer your question, in terms of what the good um, like hourly schedule, I would say, you know, try to at least maybe put in like two to three hours a day. I think that's a good, a good even number that, you know, you're not putting an excessive amount like four or five hours a day, but you're also not spending like 20 or 30 minutes. I would say maybe like two hours a day is a good starting mode. But, um, you know, Mitchell and Michael, you guys are, are new to the team, so maybe you have some different perspectives on this. Yeah, so uh, Daniel actually unmuted himself right there. So I want to see if he, he has something he wants to say. I'm not going to Yeah, laugh. so how, I think that maybe two hours a day is, is a little much. Um, I think, like we said before, it's very much what you want to do. I think that uh, five to eight hours a week is, is a good starting point. I think that what you'll find is that it's easier to commit more time as you become more involved in the project. Um, typically what happens is uh, members will, will start off with, with the Solid Rush project and get a new member project. Uh, complete those uh, obviously on schedule so maybe 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 five hours a week and then once they start getting into a system they'll slowly ramp that up but I think that five hours a week is certainly a manageable amount of time and you'll learn um, kind of what that means but I'll, I'll say five hours a week to start is a, is a, is a good starting point that's pretty representative of what uh, most of our members do uh, on kind of the first couple of weeks they, they enter the shop yeah so um to expand on that a little bit, our, our goal as a team is not to suck up every little bit of free time that you have. Um, put in however much you think that you can, in, in my opinion. Um, when I first started off, I, I, I was probably in the shop two to four hours a week. I, I really didn't dedicate too much time to the team, but um, once, once I started coming more, once I started getting more projects, slowly that ramped up. Uh, slowly, I started uh, feeling more driven to do the projects that I, I was given, uh, manufacture parts or do any little bit of design work and just kind of learn what I needed to learn from the people around me. So, um, yeah, exactly what Daniel and Randy were saying. Um, it, it really is up to you. Um, I just want to clarify. For anyone who's like interested in any specific uh, things about the car, all of the system leads are here. So if you have any questions regarding anything like that, um, it, literally any question you have about the car can be answered right now. Um, yeah, to add on to that, we also have people from uh, the EV team, GER. So uh, if you have questions about that, I'm sure they would be happy to answer. And if they want to just like give a quick run through of uh, like what their team is about, that would be awesome. 
Sure, uh, we can do that if you, unless people have questions for GMS first. So. Uh, yeah, we have one in the chat right now. Um, someone asked, have you crashed it before? Uh, Legally, no. Yes. <laughs> I'm obliged to answer no. Correct. Um, yeah, I mean, like during testing, right, it's possible to spin out and, you know, get on the grass and, and get a little rough. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing like catastrophic. You know, no one's gotten hurt from getting crashed or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, we try to obviously operate as, as safely as we can. So, yeah. And then yeah. another question. Oh. Yeah, go uh, ahead, Daniel. Just to quickly on that, uh, obviously uh, machining things is not exactly uh, the safest thing sometimes, uh, but the team has maintained a very, very high safety record. We've never reported any serious injuries or anything in anybody in terms of what they're doing on the team. So uh, that includes running the car, obviously. But yes, we're, we're, we're very proud of, of our good safety record. Yeah. Uh, so we'll let uh, GER um, introduce themselves a little bit and then we'll continue on with the questions so they kind of relate to it. It'll be pretty quick. We're basically um, the sister team to GMS. We design an electric car where, the, um, where GMS designs a combustion race car. So our car is powered by batteries and a motor. Um, Otherwise, we have very similar systems. In fact, there's a high amount of um, compatibility between the two different cars where a lot of the systems are identical. For example, suspension, um, parts of the frame, most of aero, um, stuff like that. And then um, we're also sort of designing our own stuff. So we're designing the battery pack. We're designing most of the, um, some of the parts of drivetrain. Other parts are um, identical to GMS. And we're sort of moving into the future with this where um, we think that electric vehicles are the future of racing and the future of vehicles in general. So definitely are able to uh, work on that as well. And then I think there was a question about if we've had people working on both teams. Yes, we certainly have had people um, working on both the electric team and on um, GMS. We have Kyle, who is the electrical lead for GMS and one of the electrical leads for GER as well. Um, Claire and I, I'm the project manager. Claire is the president. Um, both of us started off on GMS and then sort of split our time between the two teams um, last year, and then now we're sort of focusing entirely on this. So it's definitely possible to work on both teams. And also, if you're working on GMS on something like suspension or aero or chassis, ergo, something like that, you are working on both cars because those are going to go onto both cars no matter what you're working on. Yeah, that was really well put, Isaac. Um... Daniel, do you want to take the, the driver question? Olivia asked, who's the driver right now? Sure, so I can talk about it. Um, yes, that is one of the rewarding things that uh, you're able to do on the team. So yes, I am one of the drivers. Um, Alex is the other driver. Uh, I can assure you that's not because I'm the captain. Uh, I had some, some re previous racing experience uh, before I joined the team. That's not to say you need it. Uh, we have a pretty structured driver development program, which Alex leads, uh, and that teaches you kind of the basics in terms of uh, driving the car, how to get the most out of it. And we have a tryout process for every season to evaluate the drivers. In total, there are six drivers that are needed for competition. That's not just to do the twisty bits. We also need one to, to do the acceleration event and, and the skid pad event. So there's a wide breadth of driver skills we're looking for, but uh, the driver tryouts are held yearly. Yeah, and I'll add, um, we obviously have like a, a driver development program to choose drivers for the competition, but that doesn't mean if you're not chosen to be a competition driver, you can't drive the car at all. That's honestly one of the coolest things that you can do on the team, right? After you put in a lot of time, a lot of um, work on the team, right, you do have the chance to drive the car. I mean, I'm not a good driver at all, but I've had the opportunity to drive the car uh, and it was really, really fun. So I'm definitely saying like, that's definitely something to look out for um, later when you're on the team for a while is, is getting the opportunity to, to actually put into action what you've been working on all this time. Can I um, chime in for a second about the DDP program? Absolutely. Um, I'll be starting, the like, uh, for those of you who haven't joined the driver development um, program chat and Slack channel, if you're interested in doing so, or excuse me, interested in learning about driving and what it takes to drive the race car, et cetera, Go ahead and join that channel. I'll be having the first actual driver development meeting probably through Zoom, 
this next upcoming Saturday around six o'clock. Uh, at six o'clock, an official time will be posted later. But I'll be talking about basically the requirements, what's you know the commitments to the team, and what all goes in the selection process, and what this plan and strategy is going forward for the fall and spring semester when it comes to actually picking drivers and training them. So Anthony had a quick question, or Andy had a quick question about when is the next meeting. Um, so we hold team meetings every Sunday at 4 p.m. So our next meeting is in uh, two days. Uh, he was Sunday. asking for, for, for EV. Oh, for yeah, EV. Yeah, there you go. Isaac's got it. Got it. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so it's in the chat. Right, yeah, nice. I was trying to find the link. Um, we hold them every Sunday right after the GMS meeting. Yeah. Cool. Yep, so I'll, I'll second that real quickly. So we have weekly team meetings at four o'clock. Um, the recruitment coordinators will work with uh, new recruits that you, that you send email to try to get you on those. And that'll be kind of the, the first regular communication that you'll be exposed to. Uh, those run, I would attend, I would recommend going to both um, because there's, there's different insights uh, from each meeting, but hopefully we can see a lot of people at the Sunday meetings. That's kind of the jump off point in terms of starting your, your journey as a GMS member or a GR member. Um, and before we, we get to the next question, I just wanted to touch for those who haven't uh, sent an email or those who I haven't been uh, in conversations with. Um, once you email the team uh, uh, through that recruitment email, um, I will give you some worksheets to fill out uh, based on your interests. And it'll kind of like introduce you to uh, the concepts that you need to know for joining that system. Um, and then from there, you'll get invited to Slack and uh, I can get you started on like the team so you can um, join the meetings and stuff like that. So that's what people are talking about with Slack and stuff like that. Yep, so um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and get on the next question. So Jet asked, what do you do with the previous year's car and how much do you deviate from the previous year's design? Um, so in terms of what we do with the previous car, by rules, we're required to create a new car every year. Um, however, kind of intertwining both questions, um, we try to save stuff from last year. Um, and like, for example, if something like the suspension isn't changing or something like uh, steering, that, that system's not changing that much, we can um, take those parts and put them in, like fit them into the new car. It obviously saves manufacturing time, saves costs, um, which are limited resources on the team. Um, as well as um, how much do we deviate from the previous year's cars. Um, it always depends season by season. For example, last year we changed to 10-inch wheels, which can, required a complete redesign of all the suspension kinematic, and that um, sort of trickled down to many of the systems like frame and aero, um, had to fundamentally change all their systems to fit around that new design. And this year we're planning an even bigger design change with switching from a steel space frame to a carbon fiber monocoque chassis which is another major design change. Um, so, you know, definitely now is, um, over the past few years, we've been trying to do these bigger, larger projects um, that require a lot of design work. Um, so definitely over the past few years, we do deviate quite a bit from um, each car. Um, however, we try to, this is mainly like an iterative process. Um, there are some stuff on the car that works and some stuff on the car that we just need to improve slightly to fine tune it. Um, so it's a little bit mix of both where we try to do one big design project every year and try to, you know, do minor changes to some systems to improve them to get the optimal performance out of them. Yeah. No problem. But if you have any more questions, you know, again, feel free to unmute yourself or ask it in the chat. You know, we can stick around for a few more minutes. We'll, you know, so if you guys have questions, we'll, we'll try to answer them. Yeah, and like Shane said, they don't have to be just about the, the general team. You can ask questions about the car, too, because we love talking about the car. It's really cool. So, Yeah, we have a bunch of team members here, a lot of system leads here. So if you have questions specific about a system or some specs about the cars that we didn't cover, or just, you know, personal questions, anything like that, uh, mm -hmm. ask away and we'll, we'll, we'll answer it to the best of our abilities.
someone asked about how we incorporated the drag reduction system. Uh, Randy, do you want to touch on that? I don't know if, if Randy or Jorge or Noah is the best person to talk about that, but. Um, I could talk about it. I don't know. I, uh, Noah, if you want to talk about it, um, I'll let you do it. Yeah, I'll go over it. All right. So uh, DRS started in uh, 2018, I believe. Um, so that was the first time we did it. I don't think we ran it on comp, at comp due to reliability issues, but it was working. And then in 20, or sorry, 2019 was the first year. And then 2020, it was redesigned because the, the rear wing had another, had a fourth cascading element. So there's a whole redesign with that. And we would have ran it if, if COVID didn't happen. But um, we are actually, we're actually still, stuff to manufacture it because we got cut off halfway through. But yeah, it's, it's just, it's a electro, electromechanical system. So you have a little servo in the, in the wing and you have linkages that are bonded to the cascading elements. So, and then that's just the servo moves and it opens the, the wings to reduce drag, puts in low angles of attack. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's a servo motor that you would find on like a, a like a higher end RC plane. Uh, unlike Formula One, where there are certain zones on track where the driver presses a button, it's completely logic based. So the driver is effectively out of the loop in terms of its control. Uh, it's based on, uh, well, it's based on on the driver, but the driver is not physically do anything. Uh, it's based on steering position, throttle position, things like that. Uh, the car basically knows when it's driving straight and will open up uh, the the wing to do so. So. A little bit different than Formula One, um, but makes a big difference in terms of uh, endurance lap time. We expect roughly three quarters of a second a lap improvement uh, based on the system. And to add on to that, uh, currently only the rear wing is DRS. There's, there's no rules saying like you can't have active front wing. So if you're interested in that, that's like a very, very big project. Next question that I'd like, I'd like to answer is, is if you aren't a design leader, have a leadership position, but are actively participating and contributing to, to the club as a member, is there any way to convey the experience you've gained uh, to recruiters? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, the lead position may be uh, in terms of responsibility, kind of what we uh, consider to be like the upper level management, that does, certainly does not mean that you won't have technical projects. Um, Matt Patrick, who's a third year suspension engineer is a great example of that. He's done a lot of uh, really interesting structure stuff for the team. And basically what we do after every season is we write a very large design report for each system. And basically what will happen during career showcase is that uh, system engineers and system leads will use that design binder like their portfolio. So they'll literally go to career showcase with our physical design binder and scroll through is very much uh, the leadership position does not mean you have to, um, like, you definitely don't need that in terms of learning technical things. Um, last season, I did not have a tough formal role in the team, um, and I was still able to talk about some of the things I did. I was technically not a part of leadership at all last year, and I was still able to kind of show what I did, so certainly not. Um, and your driver's over six feet tall, I guess. I don't know. Uh, yes, I'm six foot four. I think Alex is over six foot as well. Um, Ideally, would be shorter, but ultimately, the, the fastest people on the car get to drive. So, um. I, I think we skipped over a question from Mason. Um, so, every system has their own meeting, um, and then everyone everyone attends a team meeting on Sundays, obviously. But every system has their own meeting at separate times, like on different days. Um, and these are every day. Every um, these are weekly meetings. Um, I don't think we have like a area where we can look where we have like all the times but um we can definitely make that um and send that out yes thank you for all the questions um definitely um some of our members are answering them in the chat um so thank you guys for for asking and thank you everybody on the team for, for hopping in and answering them in the chat.
and like Isaac said, we do use Slack to communicate. Um, yeah, Randy, Randy, how how can our how can our new members join in on Slack and talk to us? And then, I think that I think that's what Mitchell was just about to talk about. Oh, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I touched on it earlier. So when, if you're interested in joining the team, uh, you can email the the recruitment email, um, which I guess I can go back to in the slides. Yeah, so I'll just stay on this slide so you can see the, the contact stuff. Um, so if you email that recruitment email at the top, um, I'll have you run through some like beginner like intro uh, worksheets to kind of teach you uh, more about the car and more about the systems that you may be interested in. Um, and once you're done with that, uh, I send you a, a link to the Slack. And from there, um, it's just kind of like, working on like random new member projects and stuff like that. Um, and that's when you're really like, that's when you have connections on the team. And that's when you can easily reach out to, to everybody basically besides me. I'm, I'm pretty much the only person that, that uses the recruitment email. So um, once you're on Slack, you can, you can talk to everybody though. One thing I'd like to add to that, I, I don't know if this has been mentioned, but most of the Slack channels are public. So if there's a system that you're interested in, you can literally just join it. Like it doesn't even have to be a system that you're interested in. If you want like updates on arrow or breaks, you can just join the channel and peek out in at what's going on with them. Josh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, yes. So I, I said talking to leads on Slack is the best way to get involved in a system you are interested in. Um, so yeah, like just reach, reaching out to, to the system lead, they can give you projects that are more, that they'll probably have more projects to give you than our recruitment people will have. Um, they'll also be able to get you to learn the basics for each system. Um, and then to know how, who the systems are, uh, the system leads are. Um, in Slack, everyone has like a, a description of who they are. Um, so most people will have like, oh, chassis lead, um, fueling lead, all that stuff. Um, so you can just reach out to them or you can reach out to Daniel in, the, in Slack and then he can, tell, he can tell you who the system lead is for each system. Yeah, yeah. so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to pull up a list. So I, oh I, yeah, I, that'd be good. Yeah, usually when, when I first invite everybody to Slack, I uh, go ahead and like run through, like you can ask me anything, ask me who the, uh, who the leads are and, and who leadership is and stuff like that. So uh, Here, uh, mind if I share my screen real quick so I can show you this list? Yeah, go for it. That information is also so, available on our team website. Yes. yes. Yeah, we have a list of all the current members on our team, system leads, eboard positions. So if you go to the website, we have an entire page dedicated to that, but I'll let Michael um, yeah, run so over this. this is just a, a little list from an old PowerPoint that we did, but uh, if you want to take a picture of this or write down the names of whoever you want to re uh, reach out to. Um, mm -hmm. the, the plus Chris and Daniel at the top. Chris is the co-captain and Daniel's the captain. Yep. All right, I'll leave this up for a little bit longer and then uh, we can go back to the actual good looking PowerPoint. <laughs> And many of these people are on the call right now. So if you have a question about that system, um, they're here to answer it for you. Thank you, Beck for the conflict on the website. We've actually had um, a member on the team working on it for the past few months to make it look nice. Um, so definitely a big shout out. His name is Aiden. Um, that's also something we're always looking for is for IT people on the team. Um, that's kind of a position that gets underrated or maybe underappreciated, but IT is very helpful in making the website look good and for handling all the software. Um, so if you're interested in doing stuff like that, you know, there is a place and we're always looking for people for that. Yeah, I mean, we'll stay on for a few more minutes uh, if you guys have questions. 
but it is seven. We have gone on for an hour, and I don't want to want to hold on to you guys for too long. But you know, feel free to stick around for a little bit if you have questions. Mm-hmm. If you just want to talk to us. Um, but yeah, I think this is probably where we're, where we will formally end um, the sort of us presenting to you guys. And if you just have any questions, you know, feel free to stay on and just ask away. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, guys. Please reach out to us. I'm going to drop the email in there one more time for you guys. Okay, so here's a question. Um, are there non-technical roles on the team, like for people interested in business? Well, it's a good thing you mentioned that. Um, there, we do actually have a business team. Um, so if you're interested in joining out, um, you know, reach out to us. We do have a business team. And in terms of non-technical roles, um, and that's kind of like what eBoard is, it's a bunch of roles that are non-technical. So for example, as president, you know, managing people in eBoard positions, recruitment is obviously in charge of uh, new member interaction and you know facilitating communication with the team. Uh, we have our treasurer who's in charge of all the finances. Um, and the vice presidents, we have two. One that deals with alumni. Since we have um, 30 years of experience, we have a lot of alumni. Um, as well as the VP of sponsorship that deals with all the sponsorships that we get. Uh, we also have, you know, like I said, IT positions as well as shop manager positions, people that work in the shop and make sure that the shop is nice and clean and has all the equipment that they need. Um, so a question from Tony, I tried using the Google Docs form on the site a while back and it didn't work. Yes. Um, so I've reached out to the IT guy, uh, to Aiden, that that's been an issue we've been having on the website. I, uh, I don't know if it's been fixed by now. I know, I know if you used it a while back, it was probably broken. It has um, still not been fixed. Okay. It's still not yeah, been fixed. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, um, that's essentially just would have sent that email straight to the recruitment email anyways so if i uh, the best way to reach out is just to email that recruitment email us you know you get directly into contact with with mitchell and he can you know sort of guide you um into like what system you are and things like that GER, the Google Form that I shared earlier, definitely works, and um, so you can fill that out if you want to join that. So are there any limits to it as to how many people can be on a system? Um, no, I mean, there's really not. If you want to join a system, we're not going to say, oh, you can't join this system because there's too many people. Um, if, you know, if that's what you're passionate about and that's what you want to pursue, um, you can definitely pursue it. So I'm, I'm not going to lie. I have told people in the past uh, that systems have been overwhelmed with, with new members. Um, and I, I think that's more of a... I mean, at the same time, I do tell them, like, you can still join if you are really passionate and if you put in work and stuff like that. Um, but really, like, in my opinion, I think it, it can be beneficial to everybody if you join a system that has fewer new members. Um, because, you know, you're, you're immediately jumping in and you're getting more projects and, uh, and in the same way, that system is getting more help. Um, so it's not like a kind of, you know, I don't want to insult anybody or anything like that but i'm just trying to you know spread things out evenly yeah yeah. makes sense obviously like some systems tend to be more overpopulated than others usually arrow the system that at the beginning of the year we have a lot of new members because a lot of people want to work on the the cool wings of the car or whatever um but there are the systems that have tend to have a lot of less people you know things like like chassis not to say that chassis um fueling 
um, you know, things like drivetrain that are also a really, really cool system that have a lot of projects and a lot of things for you to do as a new member. Um, so if you join one of those systems and you're one of the few new members on that system, you definitely can get a lot of work really, really quickly um, if you're looking into that kind of thing. But yeah, like Mitchell said, we're not gonna straight out tell you you can join this system if you really wanna join that system. Yeah, so uh, here, I, I can actually expand on that a little bit and talk uh, about one of, of uh, what one of my new members has been working on uh, to give you an idea of the stuff that you could do. So um, one of the things I'm doing for the fuel system is uh, I'm changing the filler neck from an aluminum uh, neck welded onto a, uh, a corrugated plastic tubing filler neck. Basically, it makes it more flexible. Uh, you don't need a sight line, and uh, there are some other uh, pro or good things that come with that. But uh, one of the things I had him do was uh, design the way that we attach that to the tank and uh, basically research that and make sure that we have a way to do that for sure. So he has been, or he did that for me. And then uh, one of the things that he's working on now is uh, designing an electrical panel for our, uh, our dyno. So uh, he, he has been making an impact on the team. And if, if you join and commit time, you, you definitely can too. You also you also make good friends on the team. As a this is this is my friend Matty P, and now we're we're roommates. So that's also that's also <laughs> not for all right. Um, but uh, that's a, that's a good benefit of the team is we're we're all friendly, we're all nice to each other for the most part. Um, but yeah. All right, well, uh, I think we'll call here. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, please reach out to us if you have either crew an email. We'll try to get you on board as soon as possible. But otherwise, thanks, thanks for joining us today and I'll let uh, the three presenters kind of finish it off. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for coming. I hope this was beneficial. I hope you got a lot of good information out of this. Um, yeah, let us know if you have any questions. Email us. Uh, yeah.